Welcome to Flight Talk with Dave and Jeff, brought to you by Strategic Results. Today, retired Air Force Lieutenant Colonels Dave and Jeff will share with us the importance of communication in aviation. They will share some personal experiences and infamous tragedies that occurred due to miscommunication. Dave and Jeff both served in the Air Force and are now working as aviation safety advisors for the Air National Guard. First, Jeff will share the important principle of aviate, navigate, and communicate, and following the principle in that specific order. He will share an experience he had with a student who struggled with communication and how he overcame it. Hi, I'm Dave. Hi, Dave. You know, I'm Jeff, and today we're going to talk about communications as it relates to flight safety. But kind of as an introduction, uh, I've mentioned that I spent four years as a T-37 instructor pilot, and I'm kind of showing my age when I say that because the last T-37 was retired in 2009. But one of the fundamental skills we taught students was aviate, navigate, and communicate in that order. We always taught them fly the airplane first. So not only did we teach basic flying skills like aerobatics and navigation and formation flying, but we also taught how to communicate. Communicate with air traffic control, other people in the airplane, or other members of a formation flight. And while it might seem like a rudimentary skill, sometimes teaching radio communications procedures and disciplines was challenging. Students are trying to not only process all the information required to aviate, such as what's our altitude, how's our fuel quantity, and navigate with questions like what's our heading, how far to the next navigation checkpoint, and what do we do after that, but they're also trying to process and determine radio calls. So you can see that communications occurs in a pretty dynamic environment. Whether it's pilot to control or effective crew communications or within a flight of aircraft, it's one of the things that help, can help us promote flight safety. But to wind the clock back a few years, even further back than when I was a T-37 IP, um, early on, radios were not a luxury available in most planes. A halfway decent radio might weigh 50 pounds. And if you're making mail runs, which is what a lot of early aviation was, 50 pounds was a lot of mail. So radios were left off the airplane. Uh, even in the 50s, radios were not all that common. Military transports a lot of times relied on Morse code because it was clearer than voice communications. Now, i got to be honest. I don't know if they still teach Morse code in pilot training. But uh, if I was going to watch out for anything, it was going to be Morse code because uh, <laughs> they started to teach us to it. And then I, I think they thought, you guys are never going to get this. And they were exactly right. Did they teach Morse code when you went through pilot training? Yes, they did. That, that was the one time I was right at the head of my class. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, unfortunately, it's a skill I was pretty sure I wasn't going to pick up. But as communication technology improved with the uh, introduction of the uh, transistor, it became more practical to put radios in airplanes. So uh, practical in the sense that the space needed, rather than be being in cubic feet, was in inches, and the weight could be measured in pounds rather than fractions of a ton. Over the years, we've progressed through Morse code, light signals, tossing pigeons out of airplanes, which probably was a little before Dave and I, but not much, to what we have today with UHF, VHF, and HF radios. But even with the huge advancements in the past 75 years, the reason for communications between pilots and controllers pretty much remains unchanged. We need an understanding between all the parties for safe operations in flight. You know, Dave, when I went through pilot training, and even later on, we used to joke, no matter how bad things are going in the airplane, always sound good on the radios. <laughs> yeah, and it was frustrating with some students because they would key the mic, and the first words that come out would come out of their mouth would be, uh, uh, uh. And uh, you would have to jump in pretty quick and take over the radio comms for them. Well, one of the earliest pieces of advice I remember when I started pilot training back in the 70s in the U.S. Air Force was uh, 
advance your mind to 100% RPM before you put your mouth in gear. And that's good advice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, um, I had a, a student who one day we were taken off from Luke in the T-37. And now remember, the T-37 was the first airplane we flew in UPT. So there was a lot of skill. Uh, there was a lot of radio com etiquette that needed to be learned. And this poor kid just could not get a good radio call out of his mouth. And on departure, out of Luke, there was a C-9 in front of us, which was basically the Air Force version of the DC-9. And the controller read the DC or the C-9, uh, a very complex reroute. And my student keyed the mic and read it back to the controller. <laughs> and, and I said, well, congratulations. The first radio call you've ever done well, and it was wrong. And of course, I had to say disregard to the controller. But uh, as the flight progressed, we used to wear uh, vision restricting hoods. Now we had a helmet with a visor on it and the, the visor had a cover, a leather cover that went over it. And you would pull the leather cover off and then pull the visor down. And the way we used to restrict the vision is we would put the leather cover about halfway over the visor so that basically all they could see what was the instrument. So when we did instrument cross countries, that's how we practiced. And this kid hated the hood. He absolutely hated the hood. So I told him for every radio call he gets right, he can take the hood off for five minutes. <laughs> and you know what? His radio calls got a lot better after that. Okay. Dave and Jeff will now share two historical instances in which miscommunication with the air control caused a preventable tragedy. One tragedy that occurred in 1972 is uh, Eastern Airlines Flight 401, uh, an L-1011 widebody jet. They departed New York City. It was a night flight, I guess, and most, uh, everything was well. Everything went well until they were approaching the Miami International Airport for landing. Uh, when they, they lowered the landing gear and uh, the flight deck uh, crew, that's the pilot, the first officer and the flight engineer, they noticed that the, the left and right side landing gear lights illuminated, indicating that the left and right side landing gear were fully extended for, for landing as, uh, you know, as they should be. However, the nose landing gear light was not illuminated. And what this means is that the nose landing gear may not be fully extended for the landing, it may not be safe. So they told the controller what their situation was and they climbed up to 2,000 feet to troubleshoot the problem. They were assigned to 2,000 feet by the controller. They needed to determine if the nose landing gear light had just burned out or did they actually have a problem with the nose landing gear. So as they worked this problem, uh, the autopilot was inadvertently disconnected somehow. And what the, uh, what the pilots did not realize was that the airliner had begun a slow, uh, imperceptible uh, descent. It, it was descending from its assigned altitude. And when it was going through about 900 feet, uh, the air traffic controller noticed it and said, uh, what he said was, how are things coming along out there? Of course, the flight crew assumed he was talking about the landing gear anomaly. And uh, the captain said, well, uh, we'd like to turn back towards the airport. And so they were sent back towards the airport. And then after a while, the, the first officer finally noticed that they were way off their altitude. And he said, hey, what's our altitude? Uh, we're still at 2,000, right? And right after that, they impacted the Florida Everglades uh, swamp. And the, the, the flight crew heard a different message than was meant by the controller, I believe. All flight deck crew members were troubleshooting the landing gear problem, and no one was monitoring the flight instruments, which would have included the altimeter. And like Jeff said earlier, fly the airplane first, aviate, navigate, and communicate. And this was a tragedy with 101 fatalities and 75 survivors, all preventable. You know, Dave, to, to kind of piggyback on that thought just a little bit, there was a fatal misunderstanding that brought down a, a Flying Tiger 747 back in 1989, and it involved the word two. Now, there's three different definitions you can use for the word two. There's the number two, as in I've got two of something, two, like T-O, like I'm going somewhere, or two, as in also, okay? So on this night, the 747 is approaching Kuala Lumpur after a short flight from Singapore. The crew were cleared direct to uh, the KLL Beacon for the runway 33 approach. 
Well, on the approach, the crew was cleared. This is what the controller said. Descend 2400, which the crew interpreted as to 400. Okay. The aircraft basically descended below the minimum altitude and crashed into a hillside at 600 feet before reaching the NDP. The minimum height, descent height, over the NDB was 2,400 feet. So descent and maintain 2,400 feet was the phraseology that probably would have saved that Flying Tiger's crew. Controllers have a part to play in listening to feedbacks. As the captain replied, OK, 400, which went unchallenged by the controller. Now, I don't want to oversimplify this mishap as there were other circumstances involved, such as poor cockpit resource management, poor situational awareness. The first officer had earlier complained in the flight that he did not have the use of an approach plate. The crew ignored the ground proximity warning system, and there was weather at the time. But one of the key links in the accident chain was the miscommunication that occurred. And there's a lesson in that, and this is something I used to do. When a controller talks and you're processing the information, does what the controller is saying match the expectation of what you think you should be hearing? If it doesn't, never, never second guess or never guess what the controller meant and have them repeat the transmission. Interestingly, studies have shown there's a multitude of possible communication problems, possible problems with communications in flight, and we're just touching on the very tip of the iceberg here. But one of the phenomena that I've experienced is that when a pilot becomes task saturated, their mental capacity is tapped out. This may help explain why task saturated pilots tune out or sometimes fail to understand radio communications from air traffic control. As a survival mechanism, the pilot's brain will filter all other stimuli not directly related to aircraft control. When I told the story on the complacency podcast, Mm -hmm. about the student who was turning crosswind in the T-37 and decided to really roll it inverted and pull towards the ground at 500 feet and yell, Yahoo, Jester's dead. The uh, RSU controller, now the RSU is kind of a little box that sat next to the runway and acted as the controller just for that runway. And they would monitor the approach and they would monitor the departure and as we made that descending turn toward the tree line, which is, I'm sure, all they could see from their vantage point, which was, you know, probably about uh, a mile and a half away, when I talked to them later and asked them what their perspective was on what happened, they said, hey, we were just screaming into the mic, monitor altitude. Did you hear any of that? And I'm like, I didn't hear a word of it. I was so fixated on not letting the jet hit the ground that I completely deleted hearing out of my cross check. Dave will now talk about how two historical tragedies transpired, the Tenerife Airport disaster and the Ambianca Flight 52 that occurred as a result of miscommunication. Back in March 1977, two Boeing 747 passenger jets collided on the runway on the Spanish island of Tenerife in the Canary Islands. This remains the deadliest aircraft accident in aviation history. The, the original destination for both airplanes was Gran Canaria, also in the Canary Islands. Uh, however, there was a terrorist attack which caused a lot of flights to be diverted over to Los Rodeos Airport, which included the two airplanes involved in this accident. That airport was a smaller regional airport with just a single runway and a single uh, taxiway, and it's not at all used to, to having several large airplanes on the tarmac. The airport quickly became congested with parked airplanes blocking the only taxiway. Departing aircraft had to use the runway instead to taxi on. And to add to the confusion, the visibility was terrible for pilots and the control tower due to fog. So there was a great deal of added pressure on everybody, including the pilots and the control tower. Well, Grand Canaria finally became open again, and uh, both, the, both the KLM and the uh, Pan American were anxious to depart. So the tower instructed KLM, uh, the KLM crew to tax, the back taxi down the runway and make a 180 degree turn to get into the takeoff position. And, and shortly afterward, uh, they instructed the Pan American 747 to follow KLM down the same runway and exit it on a secondary taxiway to the left and then use the parallel taxiway. 
The Pan Am crew had rapidly deteriorating visibility down to about 100 yards. They could, couldn't see anything besides the runway that was right in front of them as they, as they taxied. So the Pan Am crew missed the third taxiway that they were instructed to depart the runway on and proceeded on down towards the fourth taxiway. Meanwhile, the KLM plane completed its 180 degree turn and lined up on runway 30. The first officer radioed the tower that they were ready for takeoff and awaiting their ATC clearance, which is an air traffic control clearance, not a clearance for takeoff. KLM crew then received the, their ATC clearance that specifies the route that the aircraft was to follow after takeoff, but they were not cleared for takeoff. Somehow they thought they were. The first officer said, we are now at takeoff. Uh, the controller, who couldn't see the runway or the airplanes due to the fog, he said, okay, stand by for takeoff. I will call you. Pan American at the same time made a, a transmission that said, we're still taxiing down the runway, Clipper 1736. During simultaneous transmissions, all you hear is a long, shrill sound. So the KLM crew uh, missed uh, the crucial portion of the tower's response which was stand by, I will call you. All they heard was the okay at the beginning of it. And they did not hear Pan America's transmission saying, we're still taxiing down the runway, Clipper 1736. Either message, if the KLM cockpit heard it, or the KLM cockpit crew heard it, would have alerted the crew to the situation and given them time to reject the takeoff attempt. Due to the fog now, neither crew was able to see the other aircraft on the runway in front of them, and they went ahead and barreled down the runway for takeoff. So the KLM uh, uh, crew did not see the Pan American crew, and nor did the Pan American crew see the KLM airliner until it was way too late. The KLM captain tried to clear overhead the, the, the Pan American, and it was way too late to do that, and they collided. And there were 583 fatalities, uh, only 61 survivors. As a consequence of this accident, sweeping changes were made to international airline regulations and Aviation authorities around the world required standard phraseology in aviation. Standard phraseology is critical. And I can think of another tragedy that occurred in large part due to a pilot's failure to use standard phraseology. It was from uh, Bogota, Colombia. Destination was Medellin to start with, also in Colombia, and then to New York, New York City. This was back in 1990. It was a Boeing 707. They went ahead and left with more than enough fuel for the whole journey, and they, they progressed towards uh, JFK normally. And the, but while en route, the flight was placed in three distinct holding patterns. And during those holding patterns, they burned up most of the extra fuel that they, uh, that they had. And uh, meanwhile, the weather in New York, of course, was under very poor visibility conditions. The flight continued on towards, uh, towards New York, but they were critically low on fuel. This was the language problem with the flight crew uh, just spoke Spanish as a first language. There's a standard for being critically low on fuel. It's called emergency fuel. They didn't use that term. In fact, the captain told the first officer to use the word emergency when he spoke to the controller. And uh, the first officer said he did, but he actually didn't. All he said was, we're running out of fuel. And that, to me, if I were a controller, I would would have meant an, an emergency, but that's not what they... They, uh, they have to hear. What they hear, what they wanted to hear was the term emergency or mayday. And so they cleared them for one uh, instrument approach uh, to JFK, which they, they, they failed to accomplish due to very poor weather. And then when they, uh, when they went around, it's called going around when you abandon the approach to try another one. The airplane crashed uh, about 20 miles away from uh, the JFK airport. And there were 73 fatalities that time and 85 survivors, but uh, it was another tragedy that it had they used the correct communication for uh, emergency fuel, it may not have happened. Jeff and Dave will now conclude this episode by sharing some tips about how to practice communication skills in aviation, which can be helpful in preventing errors and ensuring safety. Well, you know, Dave, until uh, the controller pilot data link communication is more widely used and controllers are routinely able to transmit data directly to a flight deck computer, ATC is going to continue to depend on analog voice communications, which you and I are, are very familiar with from years of flying. You know, we've touched on some of the potential communication errors in aviation. There are volumes of studies about aviation communications and problems that uh, folks have encountered, pilots, air traffic controllers, et cetera. 
there's a lot of lessons to be learned from communications mistakes, um, again, some of which we've touched on. But uh, to go back and uh, kind of reattack, aviate, fly the airplane first, mm -hmm. navigate, and then communicate. And if in doubt, always ask for clarification. Have a, an idea of what you expect the controller is going to tell you, and that if that doesn't match the expectation, then get clarification. Very good points all. You and I have flown the world, Jeff. We've spoken to air traffic controllers in Central America, Korea, Hungary, the Netherlands, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Philippines. Standard effective communication is a lifesaver. Don't let your guard down. All right, Dave. Well, until next time. All right, Jeff. Uh, good talking to you. See you next time. Take care. Take care, Jeff. Today, Dave and Jeff shared with us their expertise on how to communicate clearly as a pilot and the disastrous results that can ensue without following these rules. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Flight Talk, brought to you by Strategic Results. We hope you enjoyed listening.